welcome to All The Things, the unscripted podcast where we talk to intriguing people from a variety of cultures, backgrounds, and career paths and deconstruct who they are and why they think the way that they do. We dig deep and ask unexpected questions to learn about all the things from faith and current events to relationships and mental health. We want to satisfy your craving for knowledge, true connection, and real conversation. This is Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay Maestas. We are so happy to be here with you today, and it is just me today. Lenya is in D.C., but I am so excited to introduce our guest, Elizabeth Johnson from the Marriage Talks podcast. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. I'm really excited for this conversation. I feel like it is one that may be a struggle amongst a lot of people, and I was just telling Elizabeth, for our listeners, I was just telling Elizabeth, I may have an understanding of body dysmorphia in my own life, but I've actually never looked into it or understood it to, I guess, just never researched it or what it was and just kind of accepted how I felt about my body. So I'm really intrigued to hear your story and your perspective because I think it will really help our listeners. So we can just dive in if you're up for it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So tell us a little bit about body dysmorphia. How did you discover this is something that you had? How has it affected you personally? And how long have you struggled with it? So we kind of have to go back to high school um, to kind of go back to where everything originated, at least in my kind of recollection is like peeling back the onion, like when did this start and yeah. all of that. And in high school, um, my last two years of high school were really a struggle for me. Just got kind of bullied a lot um, mm. and really internalized uh, a lot of things that were said about me. And so I don't remember, like I first it started as an eating disorder and I don't honestly remember like oh, seeing pictures of these girls and all that, I think it was just like a way of coping with people not treating me very kindly. And so I just would eat very, very, very little. Um, And I wasn't, I never got to a point where I was hospitalized, praise the Lord, because that would have been just really terrible. Um, Mm -hmm. But I was just, I didn't have like any, you know, nutrients in my body. And at the time, um, my family and I, we were living in New Jersey, so it's super cold up there during the winter. (laughs) And, um, two out of the three winters I got pneumonia. And then the other winter I got bronchitis because my body just couldn't fight it. And so that's where all of, yeah, that's where all of this kind of originated from. And I think as time goes on, we kind of get better at like labeling or diagnosing things that I think people are mentally dealing with. Mm -hmm. And so, When I started, when my eating disorder started, body dysmorphia, to my knowledge, was not a term until within the past, I'm not sure how many years that term has been around. But as I have done a lot of kind of peeling back the onion and seeing like, but why am I feeling this way? Why do I view my body this way? And constantly asking why I was able to kind of sort of self-diagnose, okay, this is body dysmorphia disorder, which is where like, you see something about yourself that you don't like and then you spend like resources and hours and all kinds of stuff trying to fix it. Um, Mm -hmm. Whether it's like exercise to excess or like some people might get um, surgeries and things to just, because they don't like the way that they look. And um, I would like look at myself in the mirror and what my husband will see is not what I will see. Right. Like he will see me as a curvy woman who is like a size 10 um, in a healthy shape and a healthy weight, but I will see a woman who's much larger. Yeah. And that's kind of the the trick that your mind plays on you. Instead of seeing for who God made you, you see, you see a total lie in, mm-hmm. in the mirror. And it's really a hard thing to, I think catch because it's such a spiral and it's so easy to get caught up in it. 
um, especially with social media and all these things like that. It just kind of feeds into it. Right. Yeah. By definition, I looked it up. It's a mental health disorder in which you can't stop thinking about one or more perceived defects or flaws in your appearance, a flaw that appears minor or can't be seen by others, but you may feel so embarrassed, ashamed, and anxious that you may avoid many social situations. Have you struggled with that, Elizabeth, with not wanting to go out in public or not wanting to go to a certain event because of how you feel that you look? Yeah, for sure. Um, and it was, and it's particularly hard for, well, it was particularly hard for me when I was pregnant, um, all three times, um, when, <laughs> when your body changes like that, you're like, yeah. whoa, what is <laughs> happening? I'm not comfortable with my body to begin with. And then all of a sudden it's, I've got this, you know, I'm carrying this life, which is a, a, such a blessing and a miracle. And I'm incredibly grateful to have done that three times. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, when you're battling with something like that, it is so hard and so emotional that like, I didn't want to go places. And Michael, my husband, he's so sweet and he's so encouraging and, you know, tons of words of affirmation and um, just so kind in that area to help encourage me. But yeah, I would like not want to go places. And, and like, so the first, (laughs) the first time I was pregnant and I had to finally break down and get pregnancy clothes, Michael and I were in Target and I just bawled my eyes out. I was like, I can't fit into my clothes anymore. And he's like, babe, that's, that's okay. I, I don't know how to help you, but that's okay. <laughs> it's like, totally so normal. Sweet, Isn't I... that funny? It's like I used yeah. to try to stuff myself mm-hmm. into my clothes for as long as I could until I'm realizing like this just, I mean, literally, Lindsay, you're popping out of <laughs> your clothes. It's okay <laughs> to buy pregnancy clothes. Your body looks completely different. But I can relate yeah. and I understand. I think um, I had a season actually recently where I was really struggling and I think it had to do with like turning 30 and I don't know why that was so pivotal for me, but I just started noticing changes in my face and changes in my body and I was really thankful that after I had my babies, my body just kind of, I mean, I worked really, really hard. I worked out all the time, like twice a day. I ate really clean, so I did work really hard for it, but I know that that can be a lot harder for some women and my genes, it just made it easier for me. But now as I turn 30, it's just my body responds differently to things Mm. and um, food affects me a lot more like gluten, which I never actually thought was like (laughs) a thing. It makes me feel really uncomfortable and kind of like sick and nauseous. And, And so I'm just seeing the difference, but I had a moment or a season where I would look in the mirror and I would ask my husband, like, what do you see? Because when I look in the mirror, I see someone who's like seven times bigger than myself. And I don't understand because like I'll get on the scale and I'm like, okay, I've always, I'm like three pounds more than I've always been. But for some reason, I just see somebody completely different. And I think like you talked about, Elizabeth, a lot of that is a coping mechanism. And I think with our bodies, it's something that we really want to have control over. Would you agree? Mm. Oh, yeah. Yes. Control is definitely huge. Um, for me, I really enjoy having control. (laughs) I like to know, um, from A to B and what everything is in between and, um, and not having that control is, is scary because you, Mm. when you, you're leaving that unknown, like kind of out of your hands, it's really hard. Um, I will say though, I have, I felt a lot of, relief in the past couple of years, praise the Lord, because I've been consistent about being in a, um, in a Bible study group with other ladies. Mm. And that has just helped so much, um, constantly being in the word and in prayer and having other ladies pray for me and really just seeking the Lord on my identity in him. Because when I, when it, when I was like trying to handle it on my own, it was like, I need to control it all. And I need to have my hands on this. And like, but the tighter you hold on to it, the more you feel out of control. Mm -hmm. And when I just, uh, it's a, it's still a daily struggle. And I have to, you know, when I look at myself in the mirror, um, I have to really praise the Lord on how he made me instead of saying, well, I don't like this about my body. It's like, 
no, thank you, Lord, for making me like this. And so I've really had to work hard on like where my thoughts go immediately, like taking every thought captive yeah. and then relinquishing control of, I, I tried to control it for years and I tried to change things for years. And that's not to say that, you know, I don't desire to be healthy and work out because I love to work out. It's, it's such a good stress reliever for me. And but it's the shift of perspective, right? Yes. Where you're, I'm yes. working out to take care of myself and my body rather than obsessing with how I appear. I want, like for me, I want to be healthy so I can go run and play soccer with my boys and jump on the trampoline without getting tired and just be able to be really active and go on hikes so that we can live life and create memories together and also be around for a longer time rather than focusing on weight, which for me as if I'm totally honest, is a constant battle back and forth. And it takes a lot of repentance and acknowledging mm -hmm. like scripture says, take your thoughts captive. I have to take those thoughts captive of, okay, this is not my focus. I don't want to idolize my body because I mean, throughout scripture, all you see is that God looks at the heart, man looks at the outer appearance. We should be mm -hmm. focused on the internal rather than the external, which can be really hard, especially, I mean, for men and women, I think it's a, a different challenge. My husband has his own challenges with his body image as well. I don't think it is limited to just women. Yeah, no, for sure. Men and women. Yeah. Cause there's been things that Michael and I have talked about where things that he's insecure with and he's, I said, babe, you know, I totally get it. And, and just yeah. trying to encourage him and and what I've done lately, and it's really just by the grace of God, because for years and years and years, it's so, it's crazy just to think that I can control it on my own. And like, and when I finally explained it to Michael, like, when you see me, you're seeing really truly me. But when I see me, and then when I explain to him, like a, like a woman who is much larger and all these things and would pick apart at myself, he's like, are you serious? That's, mm -hmm. that's what you see. Like he couldn't wrap his mind around it. And for somebody who doesn't really understand that or hasn't struggled with it, it's, it's hard and it's, and it feel it also feels really shameful, really shameful to, um, to tell somebody that that's something that you struggle with. Cause at the same time of it being important to you, cause you want to look a certain way. Um, it also seems insignificant at the same time because it's like a first world problem, you know? Yeah. It feels like what, who am I to be complaining about something so petty, but at the same exactly. time it is, it's, it's this body we're living in, but I love second Corinthians five for, we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens for in this tent, we groan longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this is very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And I love this because I feel like it's telling us you're going to struggle with your body. I mean, especially as we get mm -hmm. older and we get sick and we feel weaker. And like recently for me, my back kills me when I am giving the, my boys baths and I'm like, I am 30. <laughs> Why is my back <laughs> like killing me? This is not okay. And, and it's, we're groaning right in our bodies yeah. in these, these temporary tents. And we long to put on these internal bodies with no more sickness or pain and, but I think there is also that part of that where this is who we are. This is the skin we're in. And it's hard to get away from that because every time you wake up in the morning, you're putting on these clothes. Um, but I think there's also a perspective shift where this is just a really random thing that I heard, but that has helped me a lot. And it just said, it was a quote and it said, buy jeans that fit you. Don't focus on the mm. size buy jeans or clothes that fit you and get rid of the clothes in your closet that do not fit you. Because all it is, every time you put on those clothes is a reminder of who you used to be or who you want to be if they don't fit you anymore. And then if you go to the, the store, I've tried on clothes. I don't know, Elizabeth, if you have the same experience, but I'll put on a pair of size four jeans and a size six or eight jeans. And depending on the brand, they can fit exactly the same. But if yeah. I were to walk into that store and I just put on that eight and I thought, oh my gosh, 
how I'm a four, like how do I fit into an eight? But it's totally the brand. And I've really stopped doing that to myself because I went in one day with that perspective. I said, I'm going to look at all types of brands and I'm going to try them on. And I did a video of it on social media of look at these pants. These are a two and they fit great. Look at these. These are a six and they fit great. Eight and they fit great. It is totally dependent upon the brand. And so that's been my encouragement to like my friends and just people in my life. That's just really helped my perspective because I think we can get so caught up in sizes and and the scale even and how we allow that to control us when we should be focused more internally than externally. Yeah, I actually, oh goodness, I don't know how long it's been, but I would obsess over the scale. And Michael's like, I really think that you should throw that thing away. And mm-hmm. I fought it for a little bit and I was like, yeah, because I'll get it on, I'll get on it several times a day and be like, is anything changed? Well, of course it's not changed. It's not how yeah. weight works. <laughs> but my mind is just thinking like, oh, if you get on the scale now because you haven't eaten anything, you'll you'll be you know, smaller, you'll weigh less, but all it does is it, I just obsess over it and it weighs me down and it throwing a scale away has been one of the best things, um, aside from being in the word, like getting rid of that scale for me personally, I needed to just say bye-bye, see you later. Because like you said about trying on clothes that fit, um, we recently reorganized our closet. Um, and I threw out or I donated, a ton of clothes. It was like half of my wardrobe because it didn't fit. And I was like, oh, I'll get back into it once I lose the yeah, baby we weight, which, <laughs> which is not true. I mean, you can absolutely <laughs> lose the baby weight after you have a baby. But for me and for a lot of other women, your body like skeletally changes after you are pregnant. And that was something mm. that I didn't want to admit. So even if like uh, my weight was at a uh, was at a certain number to where I could still fit into like a size eight jeans, my body, the way it's made will not let me fit into it because skeletally I'm different and just Mm. obsessing about the external. And like you said earlier, this body is temporary. We are called to take care of it and not to, Mm. um, not to destroy it, you know, by being lazy or, um, you know, and that's also part of like taking care of your temple spiritually, physically, emotionally, all those things. But at the same time, we have to have a healthy balance that these are temporary bodies and we, you know, believers will be renewed with an eternal one that will be magnificent, which is just crazy and amazing to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Just so amazing. Um, But yeah, focusing on that internal because it's just so, so easy with social media because you see everybody's highlight reel. And you see Mm -hmm. all these things that people can do to change their appearance. And so you have to take everything with a grain of salt and, and stop comparing, you know, to somebody else because they, they're designed differently than, than myself. And I can't, you know, Lindsay, I will never be your size. And that is beautiful because the Lord is an artist and he designs Mm -hmm. his people in all kinds of different ways, which is incredible. Amen. And I, I'm curious, Elizabeth, how have you navigated this through your husband? You said he's been really encouraging and compassionate, but I, at least for me, post babies, I had a really hard time even getting changed around my husband because I felt so uncomfortable in my skin. So how has body dysmorphia, how has it affected your marriage, the closeness in your marriage, the intimacy in your marriage? That is a really great question because it definitely does. It's when you're intimate with your husband, it's such a vulnerable thing. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that's, that's, that's a good thing. But, you know, after, especially like, say after you've had a baby, you're like, I feel like jello right now. (laughs) Like I want to feel, I want to have like, yeah, I want to have like head to toe Spanx and just suck everything. (laughs) Um, but yeah, it's it's definitely affected because when when you are intimate, you know, having sex with your husband, like that is if you're shameful of the way you look, which I definitely was, I would not want to do that. <laughs> I would just be like, yeah, no, maybe tomorrow and just try and be as graceful as I could about it. But for many years, I didn't say anything to him about it. I didn't tell him like how I was struggling, which 
if you've, if anybody has struggled with like anxiety or some sort of like mental, um, uh, mental disorder, like the more you stuff it down, the more it's going to eat at you and get gain more and more power. And so the right. way you break that power is by speaking it out and working through it. And it took me many years to admit that to, to Michael and just to say, look, I'm really, really struggling. And I, I don't feel sexy being around you. And I don't feel sexy when we are being intimate. It's, and for, I think for women, because we're generally more emotional and we are constantly having this, whatever it might be running through our head, <laughs> um, whether it's a to-do list or, you know, you fill in the blank. It's hard to turn All that those off. those windows open in our yes. minds. Yes. <laughs> yes. So when you're like, when you're, you want to be intimate with your, your spouse, like you can't just turn that off. Like mm -hmm. the windows just don't close. They keep running. And so um, for a very long time, it was a, it was a big, big struggle and we were not as intimate as, as we really should have been. Not like there's a magic number or anything, but I was really, because I was holding that in, I wasn't, I wasn't allowing us as a couple to thrive in that area. Uh, the enemy was getting in, it was getting a foothold into that area and really, mm -hmm. really just causing a lot of division between us. I wouldn't believe Michael when he would say like, no, you're beautiful. Or like, I love the mm -hmm. way you look. I love when we are intimate together. Like I literally would say, okay, thank you. And then on the inside, I was like, he can't mean that. There's no possible way that he truly believes that. And when, when you're kind of calling your spouse a liar, that's a big deal. And that can really open up to some really terrible things and not believing them in a lot of other areas. And so I really had yeah. to, I, and I had to admit that to him and say, look, I like don't believe you and it's not you, it's me. Like it's something that I'm working through and I needed him to pray with me through that and to really encourage me to constantly stay on top of that mindset um, because it was really, really eating at me and really causing this um, separation between us that if left unchecked, like that's how people go years and years and a decade yeah. without being physically intimate and then ending in a divorce. Like that stuff's got to be handled day in and day out. Mm. That intimacy is so crucial. And I, I always talk about this on living easy and I talk about it here, but just how those moments, that intimacy, the time, sex as a whole, or just small intimacies of holding hands and kissing and approaching one another when one gets home, those are so important to strengthen and to save a marriage. I think I know countless people, and I could probably even say ourselves, where intimacy has saved our marriage because it is literally half mm. of the marriage. The emotional aspect is so important, yes, but the physical aspect is just as important because it draws you in. It was created by God as a beautiful gift and something to be enjoyed and, and embraced in marriage. And if we read the book of uh, the Song of Solomon, all that you see through that is intimacy and passion and fire and love and, mm. and how that bonds a I relationship. <laughs> and yeah, it is spicy. <laughs> and, and it's so encouraging because I think a lot of the time Christians have kind of a really skewed view of sex as being intended for procreation, but mm -hmm. we wouldn't have the organs that we have that bring pleasure if that were the case. It wouldn't be a pleasurable, enjoyable experience if it weren't intended for that. And so right. I think at the same time, when when we're struggling with those things, like you're saying, Elizabeth, that it's there's has to be an intentionality. I love that you communicate it to him. I do not feel these things. So let's talk about it. Let's talk that through because even though you feel maybe crazy or whatever word you would use, it's still very real to you. And I think we have to accept that as, okay, this is my reality. And therefore I do need to work through it instead of, like you said, just shoving it down further and further and allowing it to create resentment and anger. And so I'm curious, just from your husband's perspective, and maybe for our listeners who have spouses listening with a spouse who struggles with body dysmorphia or body image issues, how did Michael handle that? Was he, did he take it personally and what would be your encouragement to someone who has a spouse struggling with the same thing? 
Um, that's a really good question. Um, because he, he did not take it personally. It wasn't like he had failed as a husband at all. That was what, that was my baggage that I brought to the table. And he recognized that he recognized that like, okay, look, you've got some trauma from your past, that this is how you're dealing with it. And he was so loving and like tender and graceful about it and would constantly give me words of affirmation. Like I like having words of affirmation, especially from him. It's very comforting to me if I feel like I'm on the right track as somebody who likes to achieve (laughs) words of affirmation are really good for me. (laughs) And um, so for like uh, for uh, my love language uh, in how I receive in his love language and how he gives that worked really well for us. Now I do know people who they, they could care less about words of affirmation. And so learning each other's love language to see like, okay, how can I affirm my spouse who deals with this to help them understand how I see them uh, as it being different from how they, they see themselves, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's good. And yeah. And so he, he was really, really good about encouraging me and doing the little things day to day, just like, you know, putting his hand on my back or like giving me a long embrace or kissing me or holding my hand, like all those little things, those little reminders that told me like, he finds me sexy and attractive and he loves me and he wants to have his hands on me because the Lord has ordained our marriage. And so he desires that intimacy. And that was that, that day-to-day reminder was, and still is because he's so good at it. And he, he constantly does that, which I'm super thankful for Mm -hmm. really, really helped. And he, and I know that he also prayed for my heart about that because really and truly um, there, no change is going to happen unless it's a heart change. And it's, it's interesting um, because before the interview, I was like, I know my experience with body dysmorphia, but like seeing kind of clinically what, what professionals are saying about it and like diagnosis and treatment and like what people are finding as far as a cure and under the cure, it says this cannot be cured. And Mm -hmm. I may, for the rest of my life, I may have like little bits of thoughts come up um, in my mind, but I'm much quicker about shutting those down. But truly the only cure comes if I rest in the Lord and I lay this burden at his feet day in and day out. It, I, there absolutely will be no cure if I don't do that. But mm. when I run to the Lord and I lay that burden at his feet, um, you know, he says, come to me, all those who, um, what is it in Matthew? Are weary and heavy laden. Yes. Yeah. From my yoke is yes, easy and, and my burden, burden is light. light. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And it's so true. It is. And that, that particular verse has really made an impact on other areas in my life. But with this one, like it is true. This, this burden does become easier and easier to deal with because I give it up. Like I let the Lord take it. Mm-hmm. And he, Michael has just been so good about encouraging me and really helping me, um, to enjoy my time with, he's, when I go to Bible study, he's like, stay as long as you want. Don't come back. <laughs> just stay and have fun with, <laughs> with the ladies. And so he's, he's super encouraging with, with that area and, and just constantly, um, cultivating our marriage in a, in a good and healthy way. And I will say like, we are in a season right now that I'm super thankful for where our intimacy is, is is the best that it's ever been because of how we've really honed in on how we communicate and our walk with the Lord and being honest with each other. And it's been such a, a just beautiful fruit of, of some hard work that we've put into our marriage. And so just being honest with each other about those struggles is, is so key. Yeah. That's so good. I love that you talk about laying it down and dealing with it every day and lifting it up every single day. I was having a conversation just yesterday with some girls and I was talking about something mom guilt on my end and how I realized I was walking out of target and I was like, this is something I've just accepted the anxiety that is just not warranted. And the mom guilt is something I've just acknowledged as part of who I am. And then I kind of had a moment of conviction where the Lord was like, I promise to make you new every single day by the Holy Spirit. 
I promise to continue to prune you if you abide in me. Why are you accepting this as just what it is? And I think we do that so often with um, especially things that we idolize, whether it be our bodies or our children or our marriages, that we start to just become complacent and think this is just the way that it is. But that is so far from the truth. And that's just the beautiful freedom that we have in Christ is that he says, in Christ, I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And that means the day to day, the body dysmorphia, the body image issues, the mom guilt, the struggles in marriage, the lack of desire for intimacy in marriage, all of those things can be worked through and there is freedom and there is hope in those things with Christ. But we do have to, like you're saying, Elizabeth, we have to take a second to lift them up, not even a second. We have to be very mindful Mm. to lift them up consistently and to be aware that this is not who I have to be. I don't have to remain stuck here. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And when we're experiencing those feelings and those thoughts, a lot of the time it is really condemning. So I, I fully agree with you. And I think that is just, it's really wise to be fully aware and to take it as a daily burden that you're lifting off of your shoulders and giving to the Lord because his burden is light. But I just want to say thank you so much, Elizabeth, for opening up and for being vulnerable and sharing your story and your heart. Can you tell our listeners where they can find you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, we're on Instagram, Marriage Talks Podcast. And you can also go to our website, marriagetalkspodcast.com. Um, it's a great way to connect. And we have a Facebook group. And so we're kind of kind of on all the things there. <laughs> But I've yeah. so enjoyed talking I, about this because I just I think it's something that um, a lot of people struggle with that they they might feel really embarrassed to open up about it and talk about it. And there's freedom in speaking it, speaking it out. And there's there's power that that I have been able to gain from speaking it, you know, into like my marriage with Michael and then laying that at the feet of the cross and just saying, I can't, I cannot deal with this on my own anymore. So it's been very freeing Mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. And I I think that's something I want to encourage our listeners to as well as in listening to Michael and Elizabeth on Marriage Talks podcast to just hear how they've processed through their marriage. Because you guys talk about a lot of fun things. Like you talk about fun things you do together and then you talk about heavy hitting topics and just kind of listening in to how they navigate through struggles biblically, whether it's this or just anything that a lot of couples battle with. I love that your approach is gracious and it's kind and it's fun and that you guys kind of go back and forth and both share honest and raw perspective. So for our listeners, you guys can look at the show notes and click the link to get to their podcast and hear how they work through some of the struggles in their marriage. And we also did an episode, Elizabeth and I and Michael, um, where I was on, what was it? What did we call it? Dealing with difficult in-laws. Yes. How to deal with difficult in-laws. We got so much feedback for that episode. It was so like, it personally like ministered to Michael and I, but, um, there were, there were people who listened to the show who actually didn't know, listen to the show who are much further (laughs) in their marriage than Michael and I are. And they're like, this is, this is life changing for us. Like, I wish I would have had this wow. years ago. And so I'm so thankful that yeah. you came on and shared your heart and just showered it with the gospel because that's, man, oh man, we needed that. And and I know that a lot of listeners needed that. So we're super grateful for you. Oh, thanks. That's really encouraging. I That's totally the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but, but I appreciate that so much because I don't even have difficult in-laws. So that's totally the Holy Spirit. But Well, thank you, Elizabeth. And um, for our listeners, you guys check them out. Go and take a second to listen to their episodes. And we will talk to you next Tuesday. Bye. For behind the scenes videos and photos, as well as info about our upcoming guests, follow along with us on Instagram at allthethings.podcast. You can keep up with Lenya at at Lenya Heitzig and Lindsay at at Lindsay.maestas. If you'd like to listen to past episodes or learn more about us, visit the allthethingspodcast.com.